you are able to actually have an impact publicly. The other, uh, other example is Martin Luther King with uh, J. Edgar Hoover. So if you have an impact publicly with other people, of course, the, the, the double-edged sword of that is that now you, yes, you will have people in power that will be raising their eyebrows and in some cases be trying to, uh, to squelch uh, the truth of whatever it is. And, you know, there's good journalists. There are still, there's not a lot, I would say. There's a lot of great journalists left, but there are some uh, good journalists left in the United States. And the people like Jane Mayer, Mm. Uh, who wrote a, a series and exposés of about the torture situation, and to this day, a lot of this is still classified secret. Um, the forty million dollar investigation that the Senate Intel- Intelligence Committee did, six thousand pages, it took two years, is still hidden away in some vault somewhere. So, if someone if someone is uh, knows what's in that report and calls up Jane Mayer knowing that Jane Mayer has has been the main writer about about this. Uh Talk to Colleen Rowley right now. She's a retired FBI agent, former Minneapolis Division legal counsel, who brought some of the pre-9-11 lapses to light. She also testified to the Senate Judiciary Committee about some of the endemic problems facing the FBI and the intelligence community. It was her memo, by the way, to FBI Director Robert Mueller connection with the Joint Intelligence Committee's inquiry that led to a two-year-long Department of Justice Inspector General investigation, and she was one of three whistleblowers chosen as Persons of the Year by Time magazine. And so you are somebody who has paid full and close attention, who does, I think, put yourself in, in some certain jeopardies. We were just talking to Ray McGovern just moments ago, and he pointed out that the CIA had had put a, a, a joking kill order on Edward Snowden. But people are really pissed off, people who are actually involved in this. You have Senator Feinstein today on CNN itself uh, saying that she thinks the NSA needs even more power, that they're a wonderful organization helping oh so many. I'm being sarcastic and snide and sardonic, of course, but I only can add texture and color to her statement as the uh, NSA is building this one and a half mile, square mile facility to house nothing but raw American and international data. Everything from every... Their power, uh, including threats, including, um, you know, this kind of very deceptive bill that Feinstein has put out to make people think that they they care. I saw Diane Feinstein's interview on uh, Face the Nation this, this Sunday, and she was calling Edward Snowden uh, all kinds of you know, the same things, no, he shouldn't get amnesty, he's, he's uh, betrayed the United States, etc. Well, I would say Diane Feinstein has betrayed the United States. Um, I'm just going to give you one little um, a key detail here okay. as well. When I wrote my memo in May of 2002 about the FBI's pre-9-11 lapses that were being covered up, it was, I delivered my memo after the, being debriefed by the, the staffers to... Uh, Diane Feinstein's office because I had seen her name in the paper as being on the intelligence committee and uh, when I testified to the Senate Judiciary she was one of the people there and asked a couple she asked me actually I remember she asked me a question about profiling um, she seemed fine I didn't I don't know, didn't know her at all at the time but all of these years now she has completely gone to the dark side and she thinks that massive monitoring of m- Billions, billions of people around the world, almost all of it non-relevant, including the Pope, including the head of the United Nations. <laughs> right, the, of I course mean, the Pope. Of course. Yeah. Like, who, who would have thought of that? But of course the Pope. Anybody with a wide reach needs to be even more closely monitored. And let me ask you a question, uh, Colleen Rowley. You are a former retired FBI agent, former Minneapolis Division legal counsel, brought some of the pre-9-11 lapses to light, testified, um, brought forth problems with the FBI. You personally met with Edward Snowden just a couple of weeks ago. You're fully involved, have a a really wonderful and articulate and keen focus on all this thing. Um, What is the payoff for Senator Dianne Feinstein, who introduces this bill, 
that would punish you and me for even, you know, it's like uh, the former meat disparagement laws. If you insulted a potato or a piece of steak, you could be sued by the uh, the beef manufacturers because really what you didn't want was mad cow disease, but they just won't let you insult the beef. She's trying to create the same prophylactic measure, the same... Um, shields on her enterprise of comfort what's the payoff for her to do this to us and keep championing the cause of big brother you know i think the the people that now see themselves as this you know club or the controllers of this um have just simply been corrupted now it's kind of like affected their ability to think clearly in my opinion and you can see this in many other organizations, um, you know, otherwise good people. Uh, the, pr- the priest pedophile scandal, I mean, these weren't bad people, but when they're in positions of power and over time, uh, they start then hushing everything up. They see every bit of information coming out as damaging them personally. And I don't know what, I can't explain exactly what it all is with some of these people because you would think that they would be able to tell the truth and own up to some mistakes. In fact, a former NSA director, uh, Bobby Inman, actually uh, gave that piece of advice. Uh, he said, you know, well, you know, if, if Snowden is putting this in for uh, Snowden's disclosures, it's not Snowden personally, it's the journalists now, but if they're uh, giving this information out, you know, over time, why, do, why doesn't the NSA just go out now and level and tell everybody it's going to come out anyways? So why, that's what the former NSA director. And it, you, you see these people fighting tooth and nail uh, to still obfuscate, you know, they will deny that they do, uh, even though the documents speak for themselves, they still are denying a lot of it. Um, they go into to these committee meetings. I happened to sit through the October 2nd Senate Judiciary meeting that featured Clapper and Alexander um, testifying, and they were not for, they were not made to be sworn in. They were the fact witnesses, and they let them get by without even raising the right hand and swearing to tell the truth. Then the second part of that judiciary meetings were two law professors, and they had to raise their right hand uh, as to swear to tell the truth about their legal opinions. It made no sense whatsoever. Well, but it does make but, sense, doesn't it? That's the thing, well, is, and I think you point this out in, in much of your bravery and hard work. It makes sense because none of this is an oops or a boo-boo. And that's the part that the public really needs to wrap their head around. It's not clodhopperism en masse, though that certainly may be part of it, but these are conspicuous planned events, well-orchestrated and well-executed, unlike the stuff you exposed, which was clodhopperism, a lot of it. But these people really are focused. Feinstein clearly knows what she's doing, and I wonder if she's got financial skin in the game stock in the, many of these enterprises or receives cash and prizes in ways you and I can't even imagine. Why would well, anybody... I know, I know her husband uh, has connections to the defense industry. That's always been the case. I don't know if she's got direct connections to the surveillance. There's like 2,000 private contractors. Uh, Booz Allen is just one of, of thousands of, uh, of these private contractors that, that are making hand over this money. And I think it is, there's a huge revolving door between people in government, mostly the executive branch, but actually also the legislative branch, especially in lobbying and staffers uh, that go back and forth between these these uh, positions where they make a lot of money, then they might take a stint in a think tank back and forth. You see that the think tanks are all along the same lines. They're putting out the fodder, these talking points, and then, uh, you know, a Feinstein can go in and, and claim that if we had just had massive uh, NSA monitoring, we, we would have been able to prevent 9-11 when it's precisely the opposite, that there was a lot of information. And, in fact, the officials claimed they had too much information, and that is why they were unable to read it, to share it, uh, to act on it, and especially to share it with the public. By the that kind- peculiar yeah. logic... Colleen Rowley, former FBI special agent. By that peculiar logic, they're simultaneously building this uh, one-and-a-half square mile data center, this massive, huge complex in Utah to store all the data. 
so since they say too much data means we can't sift through it and it becomes burdensome and impossible therefore we're going to now build a superstructure to hold even more of the stuff so that we really can't do our job again these are prevarications these are false statements in some way these defy the if p then q basic boolean logic string and yet we're all supposed to believe it because we really don't have, sadly, as we, we talk about journalists, we don't have anybody at the news network level uh, parsing this stuff out. They just say, and now a commercial. So this is hard. And, and it's, it's, a, it's Einstein's definition of insanity. Mm. If you, you know, and, of course, some of this is because of controlling uh, the message. And now we're going right back to why are they doing this, this massive uh, effort to um, get as much info and control people's thoughts and their messaging and, and chill. Certainly this will have a chilling effect upon association and speech and everything else. Well, it's to control the message. And, you know, we, we're looking almost at we're at, we're at the uh, um, abyss of Orwell, and seeing this this world that exists where you know the the government seeks to control all of the communications and it's diluted i think you know the thing is we saw this in almost science fiction slash horror shows all along there'd be a james bond where some evil mastermind was trying to control things and you kind of laugh about it saying well isn't that funny it, it 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 is funny it cannot work it absolutely cannot work these are uh Minority Report type movies where it, they they claim they can predict who is the uh, the criminal or the terrorist. These this is all um, you know. I suppose people would like like this to exist because they're scared. So they would like these government claims that if we just gather all this information, we can protect you and pre crime. People- Stop it before it happens. Yeah. It, it's it's an appeal to to base fear uh, these emotions that are are used then to control people. I've I've identified five main emotions: fear, hate, greed, false pride, and blind loyalty. And when you press those on most people in sequence, you you own them. You can kind of control them. Now, if you own the the, the ways and the means of communication, and you're able to uh, you know cow your independent media. Yeah. and your journalists into, um, you know, as happened uh, in the lead-up to Iraq where they put all the, the Pentagon uh, retired generals on CNN telling us that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. I think that is the model. That is exactly what they want. They want the ability to control the message. And, and that's really what's on the line right now. Let's say, hey, uh, Colleen, I just, I'm going to jump in because people come and go, jump in their cars, get out. They're listening on a smartphone, on an iPad right now, on anything basically with a chip and signal. So we never know when they come and go. So I just want to reintroduce you. We're talking right now to Colleen Rowley, a retired FBI agent, and former Minneapolis Division legal counsel. She's the one who brought some of the pre-9-11 lapses to light, testified to the Senate Judiciary Committee about some of the endemic problems facing the FBI and the intelligence community. It was her memo to FBI Director Robert Mueller in connection with the Joint Intelligence Committee's inquiry that led to a two-year-long Department of Justice inspector general investigation she happened to be one of the three whistleblowers chosen as persons of the year by time magazine further back in april of 2003 following an unsuccessful and a highly criticized attempt to warn the director of the fbi and other administration officials about the the basic dangers of launching this invasion against iraq she she colleen rowley stepped down from her GS-14, I guess that was your status legal position, to go back to being a regular FBI special agent, then retired from the FBI in around 2000. And some things are actually more dangerous. Going into a hospital or taking a medication, There's, I think the figure is 200,000 people in the United States die of uh, improper medications or, or a mistake made by a hospital. It may even be higher than that. So if you look at if you look at the true risk to yourself and then say, well, why nobody thinks about those kinds of things. But yet we constantly have this in the forefront of our mind. Uh, I think only seven Americans have died, something like that, since 9-11. It's just a handful, 30. That's it. It's 30 Americans have died 
uh, due to it, uh, terrorism. And yet, that's what is motivating most of this uh, trillions of dollars that have been spent on wars, yeah, on, and, and, on and, and, monitoring. And Colleen Rowley, former FBI special agent, due to terrorism from brown people. We're not talking about uh, how many black people uh, in Texas are still being um, harassed, abused, how many people die from just crazy, wretched lunatics, no matter what the color of skin or religious affiliation. Uh, It's a a a much greater number, but these resources are not necessarily focused on them. They're focused on the thing that you and I can't really see ourselves, but have to trust people like Dianne Feinstein to declare and reinforce over and over again, they're out there and they're coming after you, and you need to give her, let her be the sole uh, decider using a George Bushism. I get to do that every year and feel really good about it. <laughs> uh, she gets to be the one that uh, holds the baton or the bullwhip. And uh, frankly, uh, it frightens me. I don't think she's a uh, the right kind of person to do this. And she's got way too much passion to do the wrong thing. And that, to me, is a red flag. Well, if there's somebody out there who uh, wants to throw their hat in the ring and, and run against Diane Feinstein, they ought to do it. And even if they don't have, uh, cannot self fund, are not a millionaire and cannot self fund, I think it would be worth it just because people need to write about her positions. It's just not getting enough um, enough uh, exposure. And, you know, people vote on for, for very silly th- reasons. You know, she's the incumbent, whatever. So if, if, um, the, going back to this fear-based uh, propaganda, though, exactly what you were saying is this is deliberate, and if people understand that they are the target of propaganda to manipulate them, uh, you would think that people would get angry about that and say, I'm, I'm tired of being constantly, my, my buttons being pressed in this, this fear-based when you mentioned right-wing terrorism, uh, domestic terrorism, and that doesn't include the kind of uh, people who just lose it, like the, the black shooter, and uh, so many of these are the, the woman in D.C. who apparently was mentally ill, and et cetera. There's, that is a much higher uh, threat. Uh, right-wing was at least twice as many as uh, Islamic extremism, and yet almost no resources are going into that as compared to what we're doing internationally uh, to to uh, uh, on this very low risk. And if anything, we're making it worse. If people think that um, you know, the last night on sixty minutes, there was a a show on Guantanamo, and uh, the sixty minutes host kept saying, 3,000 people were killed, you know, and they were talking about prosecuting the, the uh, suspects, and she kept saying 3,000. Well, the United States now has killed, well, hundreds of thousands of people all over the world. Of course, everyone knows Iraq and Afghanistan, but also in Pakistan and Yemen. And if anything, if it was a zero-sum game, uh, you know, we would have killed several hundred thousand. You'd think we'd be making progress. Well, no, because all you're doing is increasing the hatred around the world. Right. They have family. We, they have friends. This and and when, so you, when you kill the town priest, all those parishioners are going to be really upset. When you kill the schoolmaster that has educated four different generations of children, then those parents and those family members are going to be upset. You're absolutely right. And, and unfortunately, we've run out of time, Colleen Rowley. I really want to thank you so much for joining us here on The Smart Show. Would love to have you back when you're available. Uh, you are just such a bright light in such dark times. So I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for supporting Edward Snowden and other whistleblowers. Well, when in doubt, support it out. That's what I say. And if it rhymes, it must be true. All right. Thanks so much. By the way, if you're watching us right now live on our YouTube stream or just listening to us, I'm holding up a gold certificate. This is a night for two in the fabulous, famous London hotel called the Athenium. And I'm giving it away. All you have to do is fear by Time Magazine. And so you are somebody who has paid full and close attention, who does, I think, put yourself in in some certain jeopardies. We were just talking to Ray McGovern just moments ago, and he pointed out that the CIA had had put a, a, a joking kill order on Edward Snowden. 
but people are really pissed off. Some of the pre-9-11 lapses to light. She also testified to the Senate Judiciary Committee about some of the endemic problems facing the FBI and the intelligence community. It was her memo, by the way, to FBI Director Robert Mueller connection with the Joint Intelligence Committee's inquiry that led to a two-year-long Department of Justice Inspector General investigation, and she was one of three whistleblowers chosen as persons of the year. Investigation that the Senate Intel- Intelligence Committee did, 6,000 pages, it took two years, is still hidden away in some vault somewhere. So if someone if someone is uh, knows what's in that report and calls up Jane Mayer, knowing that Jane Mayer has is, is been the main writer about, about this. Uh, Talk to Colleen Rowley right now. She's a retired FBI agent, former Minneapolis Division legal counsel, who brought... You are able to actually have an impact publicly. The other, uh, other example is Martin Luther King with uh, J. Edgar Hoover. So if you have an impact publicly with other people, of course, the, the, the double-edged sword of that is that now you yes, you will have people in power that will be raising their eyebrows and in some cases be trying to uh, to squelch uh, the truth of whatever it is. And, you know, there's good journalists. There are still, there's not a lot, I would say. There's a lot of great journalists left, but there are some uh, good journalists left in the United States. And the people like Jane Mayer, mm. uh, who wrote a, a series and exposés of, about the torture situation, and to this day, a lot of this is still classified secret. Um, the $40 million in...